Anne Boleyn has been described as the most important consort that England ever had. Her marriage to the infamous King Henry VIII changed the face of the country forever, as she demanded that Henry would annul or divorce his first wife before she would take to the king's bed. Because of this, Henry looked for a way out of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and following the Pope's refusal to grant the annulment, then Henry would split from Rome himself. He tore England away from the Roman Catholic Church, and Henry declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England. He forced the country to accept him in this position, and those who did not accept it were thrown into prison, and sometimes were even executed. Henry even executed some of his closest friends because of this. But despite marrying the king, Anne Boleyn would also meet a bloody end inside the walls of the Tower of London. On Tower Green on the 19th of May 1536, Anne Boleyn walked out to the scaffold and found herself faced with a French swordsman who would strike her head off in one swift blow. After her death, her remains were interned inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula at the Tower of London, just behind where the scaffold was placed. But during the Victorian times, the chapel was renovated and during these works, the workmen disturbed the resting place of Anne Boleyn and a number of other executed Tudor figures and they discovered the body of one of England's most famous queens. Join us today as we look at disturbing the grave of Anne Boleyn at the Tower of London and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. It was Thomas Cromwell who expertly spun a web of lies and deceit against Anne Boleyn which resulted in her fall from grace, split from the king and eventually her death. Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married in January 1553, but the public did not know that months previously they had been married in a secret ceremony. The marriage split many of Henry's closest friends and advisers, and it caused a significant strain on the religion of the nation. With Henry becoming the supreme head of the church and breaking from Rome, he forced the clergy and his advisers to accept the change, and some people could not accept this. Thomas More, for example, could not accept the change and eventually was sent to the Tower of London and was then beheaded on Tower Hill. Many could not also accept that Anne Boleyn was the Queen of England and many did not support the King's new marriage and Anne when she was instilled as the Queen of England. It seems Anne and the King were happy for a number of years but the King eventually grew frustrated of her as she could not provide him with the male heir he greatly wished for. A number of miscarriages in the birth of a daughter disappointed the King and Henry's eyes began to shift and wander towards a lady in waiting of Anne's, Jane Seymour. Henry neglected Anne, and there was a number of incidents in which Jane was caught with the king, including one where she was sat on the king's knee. When Anne saw this, she flew into a rage, and it's believed the stress brought on by this caused her to lose a baby. But by March 1536, the king's attention was very much in the favour of Jane Seymour, and he began to court her, and it was alleged that Jane was pregnant. But Henry then put Thomas Cromwell to task, trying to get him to find a way out of the marriage with Anne Boleyn. Cromwell, a master tactician and player at court, then had Anne investigated for a number of charges. Anne found herself accused of incest with her brother George, high treason and adultery with four other men, who found themselves executed on Tower Hill for their false involvement with the Queen. Anne was placed on trial, and the male-dominated jury sentenced her to death, and it was clear that Henry's ruthless nature caused the death and downfall of his wife Anne. She was held inside the Tower of London for a while, and her execution was scheduled for the 19th of May 1536. Anne was led out of her lodgings at the Tower of London, and was brought to Tower Green, where a scaffold had been made for her. She climbed up the stairs and it was said, she gracefully addressed the people from the scaffold, with a voice somewhat overcome by weakness, which gathered strength as she went on. She begged them to pray for the king, in whom she had always found great kindness. The spectators could not refrain from tears. She then said her goodbye to her ladies-in-waiting, and the executioner faced her armed with his sword. To perform the job cleaner, Henry ordered a French swordsman to come and complete the bloody job of taking his wife's head. The expert executioner performed his job well, and Anne's head was struck clean off in one stroke, to the gasps of the witnesses. After executions took place on Tower Hill or Tower Green, there was a similar protocol that was usually adhered to. If it was Tower Hill where the execution took place, then the body would be placed inside of an arrow chest, and then the head would be placed on London Bridge on a pike. But inside the Tower of London, the same sort of system occurred, in which the remains were then placed inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula and buried. 
The chapel inside the tower's walls is a Tudor one, and under the floors are around 1,500 people who were executed. It's a burial place of many of the Tower of London's most famous prisoners. Anne Boleyn was interred there after her execution, but also Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth queen, Lady Jane Grey, George Boleyn, Thomas Cromwell, and others have had their remains interred inside the chapel. Anne was the second person laid to rest inside of the high altar, inside of the chapel during the Tudor times. There were 13 other men and women who would follow, being laid inside the chancel after executions occurred. Usually those who were executed for serious crimes such as treason warranted no gravestone or marker. The resting places of many of these people were not marked, and this was the same with Anne Boleyn's burial. It was not marked, but a register of the burial was kept. It was written that their corpses with the heads were buried in the chapel, in the tower at the high altar. The plan of the interments inside the chancel then showed that Anne Boleyn's grave was to the left of the altar, and more burials took place over the years there. But as time went on and centuries passed, the chapel came into a rather poor state, and was not looked after or maintained. It was Queen Victoria who, when she visited the chapel and the tower, ordered that the chapel was not fit for a place of royal burial, and it was said it was not a royal chapel, but had instead just become a meeting house. During the reign of Queen Victoria, big renovations and improvements were made to the chapel, and Victoria herself ordered that this work should take place. She ordered that the decoration inside should be improved, and also the heating system should also have been improved and sorted out. The plans were drawn up to restore the chapel, there was a large amount of restoration, but because of the work it meant that a number of the high-profile graves inside of the chapel needed to be disturbed. The pavement had sunk and was very uneven, and it was said that when the flagstones were lifted, that many of the bodies had been buried inside of the chapel during the Tudor and Stuart periods had been found. All of the remains that were discovered were then gathered and were collected and were locked and enclosed within boxes. On the boxes, inscriptions were written, then coffins were taken from the crypt. The floor was then relaid, but the high altar had been left where Anne Boleyn lay at rest, but changes to the plans meant that the exhumation of one of England's most famous queens had to happen. It was on the 9th of November 1876 that the remains of Anne Boleyn were lifted from their place of rest. She had been there for over 300 years, but whilst people went about their daily work outside the walls of the Tower of London, the body of a Tudor queen was being lifted. At around 12.30, there were five workers gathered around the high altar, and using the plan of the known burials, they found Anne's remains and began to excavate. They lifted the pavement first and carefully removed the earth, one spade at a time. They dug around two feet down, then Anne's remains were found. It was said that all of her bones had been piled together in one spot, but for some reason the remains had been tampered with before. Anne Boleyn's grave had been disturbed by the collapsing and deteriorating of a coffin of a 54-year-old woman named Hannah Beresford, who had been buried nearby in 1750. The cause of the collapse was this burial, and it disturbed the former queen's resting. On hand at the burial was a surgeon, Dr Frederick Moat, who recorded forensically the remains of Anne Boleyn. He wrote of them that, a female of between 25 and 30 years of age, of a delicate frame of body, and who had been slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small, and especially well formed. The vertebrae were particularly small, especially one joint, which was next to the skull, and they bore witness to the Queen's little neck. After the initial inspections took place, a more thorough exam took place, and it was said that Anne's remains, the bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull, with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face, and rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebra and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height, with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of the chest. The hand and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet, with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. It was estimated that Anne was between 5 feet to 5 feet 3 tall, and it was confirmed that her body had been beheaded before it was laid to rest. The men who had exhumed the body of Anne Boleyn all commented that it was a female's body, and after the exhumation process had taken place, the remains were handed over to the Governor of the Tower of London. He then placed these inside his personal residence, the Queen's House, for a period of time, but more bodies were found, including those of Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, and also Margaret Pole. 
The remains were held inside the Queen's house for five months, whilst the work was being carried out, then Anne Boleyn was returned to her final resting place. On the 13th of April 1877, workers at midday, accompanied by the resident chaplain of the Chapel of St Peter at Vincula, gathered around the high altar. Each of the excavated bodies had been placed inside a specially made casket, including Anne, and the caskets were made from thick lead and were encased being held with copper screws and oak plank. An etching was made onto each of the coffins, marking who was inside it in the year they passed away, and also the date they were reinterred. A note was then taken of the location of the burials, and they were then marked with a decorative floor tile, showing the location of the graves. When we visited the Tower of London recently, we were fortunate enough to be on our own inside the Chapel of St Peter at Vincula. Inside was just one other person, a yeoman warder or beef eater. He was knelt inside of the chancel beneath the grave of Anne Boleyn, having a few quiet moments of prayer and reflection. To many today, Anne Boleyn is still seen as a victim of the lies of Thomas Cromwell and the brutality of her husband, King Henry VIII. Her execution was a criminal act and her trial was a sham. The disturbing of her grave ultimately led to the remains being treated in a more respectful manner, but today she's seen as one of England's most captivating figures in history. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.